Yeah. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going gonna, gonna to kick it off today. Um, oh, boy. There's, there's something I'm going to talk about. Um, I always, one of the big things that I, I like to, to really share with you folks is, you know, we hire extremely hard uh, to hopefully manage easier. I say it all the time. Um, training, 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 right? It's, it's absolutely, you know, mission critical. We had that uh, very critical incident with, with Sergeant Callagher, who's retired, um, and he reverted right back to his training. He saved that woman's life, and that switch from guardian to warrior, and then once the mission is complete, that switch back to guardian to render medical care um, to both the victim and the suspect. And, and we really do have an amazing staff, and, and that's why I say hiring, promoting, and training is so very important. So this week, uh, we had an individual at 3 o'clock in the morning. He went to the fire department, uh, broke into one of the firefighters' vehicles, stole some things out of it. One of them was this, this laser tool. It kind of looks like a firearm. He then broke into the fire department, he smashed the glass doors, you'll see they're boarded up right now. He entered the vestibule and he was pointing the laser at the dispatchers, they thought they were going to be shot. They contacted the police department, uh, three of our officers arrived, um, proud to say I hired all three. Uh, they drew their firearms, the individual pointed this, what they believed was a firearm, at the officers. And one of the officers determined it is not a gun. And he immediately notified the two other officers that were there, it's not a gun, it's not a gun, as the laser was on one of the officers' chests as they were both to fire. They ended up taking that individual into custody, uh, and he was criminally charged with a number of different things, obviously breaking into the fire department, malicious destruction, um, amongst others, and breaking into the firefighter's vehicle. Um, but it just goes to show you, you never know. And, and that's right here in our, in our lovely town of Westboro, where our officers have to sl switch from that guardian model of policing to an absolute warrior, and then back to the guardian. And it's all on body camera footage. And if you could see how empathetic and how caring they were trying to calm this individual down, this obviously going through a type of crisis makes no excuse. Um, but at the end of the day, it was very terrifying for our dispatch center, and it was very, very stressful for our officers. And we made sure I contacted them um, and to make sure that they are okay, both physically, but also uh, mentally, because it's very important, because it's very stressful. So I'm very proud of our staff. Um, we just gave another conditional offer, and we're still looking to hire, uh, because we were granted uh, our, our proposal. Um, so our, hopefully our staffing numbers will continue to rise. We were supposed to be at 42. Um, we'll hopefully be at 40 uh, at some point. But um, obviously, COVID and some of the issues we're dealing with. Uh -oh. Mike, not, did it? Some of the issues we're dealing with um, are, you know, we understand it's not working. It was. Yeah. So today, I'm very excited. We're going to talk about some of the things that, that makes Westboro Police Department a very special department. And, and we have Lieutenant Daniels here today. He's going to talk about, uh, give you an, uh, just give you a briefing on the ABLE uh, program that we're involved in with Georgetown University and accreditation. Again, that professional stamp on the agency and where we are with that. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job. We should be, I'll let him tell you the timeline, but we should be certified shortly and then accredited, I'm hoping, in the fall. It's been a lot of work. And he can explain some of that work that he's doing in Sergeant Shipperette that really makes our police department in our town a special place. So we're working extremely hard for you folks. If there's a topic that you want to hear from us, please reach out to me or the lieutenant, and we'll be happy to put it on. And thank you for having me on the third Friday of every month. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, lieutenant Mike Daniels, Westboro Police Department. Um, the chief did tell me, full disclosure, here that I was supposed to do this talk. I was not aware I was doing it today. I found out this morning, <laughs> and he's gonna kill me for saying that, but I'm okay with that. Um, so anyway, um, obviously I've, um, everyone really kind of knows who I am. I've been here several times. Um, what I think um, is important is to really understand what my role is. Um, 
the chief had asked the town to support an administrative lieutenant position, which is my current role. Um, and a part of what I do is fairly new to the to Westboro Police Department. Um, you heard the chief talk about the body. Thank you very much. You heard the chief uh, talk about the body worn camera program, which is quite a significant <coughs> undertaking. Um, as far as going through some of the videos that we have and then really redacting and, and editing them anytime there's a public information request or someone from Westboro District Court or Worcester uh, Court wants public information for a case that they're following. So um, that's one of my roles. The other role, um, which is a little bit larger in the sense that it is going to help our organization not to say that we're not a professional organization, we're extremely professional, we're aggressive, but it's gonna sharpen all our tools in our toolbox. And what I mean by that is, is that the accreditation process really takes a look at an organization's policies and procedures to see if they're best practice. Are they the best policies and procedures that we have? Um, are we meeting certain standards? certain performance standards that the police department is supposed to have. Now, uh, Sergeant Shipwreck, who's my assistant accreditation manager, he helps me out uh, tremendously. He couldn't be here today because he, he's, he's sick, um, but he helps me with that. It's a role that is very important to our agency. It's important to um, our command staff because it puts a, a professional stamp on our organization. And I'll give you an example of some of the things that we look at. Um, as you know, we have a fairly new building, right? It was um, done over, we moved, it's been what, three years since we've? Two and a half. Two and a half. So we've moved back into this, into this new building. Now, everything was done um, to code, but what we then have to do at this point is really look at every piece of that the, the space that we use, for example, our holding cells, right? It's not enough just to build a holding cell and say, hey, this is a holding cell. We have to go through every single thing to make sure that we're mitigating any potential liability issues, and that's all done through policies and procedures. Um, you know, are the speakers working when we need to communicate with someone that we're holding? Um, are the uh, cameras that are inside the uh, cells working. Is everything functional? Are there any weapons or anything loose that could potentially harm an officer? Are they present, right? So the accreditation process, it creates, it makes us create a policy and procedure that's in line with national standards to say this, if you meet these requirements, there's nothing else really better that you could do or more that you can do. And that's what we're striving to do. Um, you know, we're really, essentially what, what's happening is, is that we're responsible for meeting the requirements of 353 standards. So, Thanks. essentially, what we're doing is we're going through any of the policies and procedures that we've had, we're updating them, revising them, and making sure that they're in line with the process of accreditation. and. The biggest pain in all that is that we have uh, the post commission, which obviously was uh, just recently established, and they've added some new things that we have to now go back and look at and change. So we take two steps forward, and then you know new legislation comes out. It kind of sets us back. But I am happy to announce that um, uh, through my conversation with Sergeant Shipwright over the last couple weeks, we're actually ahead of where we want it to be. Um, the problem is, is that the commission's not ready for us because they switched over to a new standard, sixth edition. They released it in March. Sergeant Shipwright and I had everything done within a month. And there's no other police department that's in line with that yet. So they don't even have people to come in and assess us that are trained to the sixth edition. So we have to wait. <laughs> So, and, it, and it, that, that's kind of frustrating because this was a, a top goal for the chief and we're ready to go. Um, there's some minor things that we have to do, but um, that's, that's where we're at. I'm hoping we can get certification. It depends on when the commission meets. We're hoping certification by the fall and then the first quarter, we're looking to get accreditation. And that, 
that is huge. And it's huge for the town because one of my other things is I look at, um, I'm one of the, uh, the municipal insurance liaisons with the town. So every quarter we get a checklist that asks, is the police department in line with these things for law enforcement liability? So I look at those things. If there's training that needs to be had, I make the deputy chief and the chief aware of it. We look at training or we give an individual something to train on that meets those requirements. Um, and accreditation, everything that we do for accreditation, everything that we have been doing um, helps us because what I've been seeing over the last couple of years, all the standards that are within accreditation makes us automatically fit the criteria for all the law enforcement liability issues that we would come across. So essentially, what we would see is a 7% reduction over for just law enforcement liability for the town for insurance premiums, which is it's huge. It's a, it's a nice savings for, for uh, the community and the taxpayers. So, that's that. If you guys have any questions, I'll leave room at the end for questions about accreditation and certification. Um, another thing that we're working on, which we haven't been able to really do yet, is um, you probably heard me a few uh, visit, visits ago. Um, we talked about the ABLE program. ABLE is a, um, a course that was designed by uh, an individual who's a, a PhD out of uh, UMass here, UMass Amherst, but the program itself is from Georgetown University, it was formulated there. And basically what ABLE stands for is Active Bystandership in Law Enforcement, okay? And I remember asking a question the last time that I was here, and someone answered it very eloquently, what is bystandership? What is active bystandership, right? A lot of times police officers are accused of not policing our own, right? That is the biggest complaint, right? You hear it, you see it. You know, uh, people get upset because they feel like we're not <laughs> holding each other accountable. What ABLE does, and I'm an instructor, what ABLE does, it allows police officers, it, it allows an organization to adopt an active bystandership mindset. And what that means is, is and I'll, I'll give you an example of one of the case studies that they use. They use a case study of a lieutenant who my rank. <laughs> um, they use a case study of a lieutenant who is booking a prisoner, right? This prisoner is unruly and is having issues with a female officer that arrested him. The female officer, in response to the prisoner, starts losing her temper because she's being ridiculed and she's seeing that no one's intervening or helping her. So as the lieutenant is booking this prisoner, he lets the behavior continue. He sees the irritation in the officer, sees that the officer is now losing their temper. And she ends up assaulting the prisoner because he's attacking her verbally, right? So active bystandership allows a police officer, and it holds us accountable for monitoring those behaviors when we see them, especially in a supervisory role. Right? It holds everybody accountable, patrol officers, anybody that's around that performs a police function, it holds us all accountable. Um, and that's what that training does. It says, okay, listen, you're, you're seeing a situation, you have to acknowledge there's a situation, you have to remove your fellow officer from it before it progresses to the next level, right? Um, people sometimes forget that police officers are human beings, right? And I hate to say, you know, we have feelings. We do. You know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> um, we're just like everyone else. And, you know, we're placed in, in, you know, we handle stressful situations all the time, and it does take a toll, right? And in addition to handling things here, you, they may have something going on at home that we, we're not, we're not <laughs> cognizant of. And so ABLE trains us to, if you're a supervisor, to check in with your officers. If you see an officer's coming in late or there's something going on, their mood changes, it trains us to not only recognize it, but take action, realizing that their mental stability, based on you know, things that might be out of their control, 
could be compromised, right? And it gives us an opportunity to say, hey, I noticed that you know you were a little abrupt on that car stop, or you did something a little different that I haven't seen you do before. Is there something that I can help you with, right? Is there, you know, do you need help outside of the work environment? And if you do, I'm here to support you because. I don't want you to be in a situation where you compromise the integrity, your integrity, the integrity of the organization, or our profession, right? So does that all make sense? Sounds wonderful. <laughs> so, and, and that, these are all things that, you know, the Westboro Police Department is doing, and it's funny because, you know, as I've, you know, in my role now, I'm not out on the road as much, so I have kind of a, a I guess a broader view of the organization. Um, you know, it's very different when you're out on the road and you're supervising your employees and your, your focus is really on the people that are under your watch, right? But as a lieutenant, a chief, a deputy chief, um, and anybody else, we're all responsible for those employees. And so now, in my role, I have an opportunity to really see those things and how it's affecting the whole department, right? Um, and if need be, we take we take we take action. Um, it's interesting. Uh, also, is um, there aren't many police departments that are doing what we're doing. Um, and you've heard me say before that I'm extremely proud to be a member of the Westboro Police Department because of these things. Um, you know, um, the whole George Floyd incident, you know, I talked about before, it, we took a hit, not as, not just as a police department, but as a profession. Um, you know, to me growing up, um, I felt this profession was an excellent line of work to get into because it's very honorable. And everyone that I work with feels the same way, and we want to keep it that way. We want to make sure that the people that we're serving, they see that we're transparent, that we're trustworthy, and that we're here for the community. So this is, you know, this is why, you know, I'm obviously very proud to be here, and I'm proud to actually be here in front of you all and having this opportunity to, to talk to everybody about the ABLE project and also what we're doing as far as accreditation. So Chief, do you have anything else? Just questions. <laughs> okay. Sure. I'll open it up for questions. Anybody? Just. I. So when you do see some aberrant behavior, maybe not major, maybe just consistently coming in late or something similar, mm -hmm. and your mm -hmm. officer does not tell you what's going on or refuses help, then what do you do? So one of the things that they always say is that you can't, you can't get involved in someone's personal life unless you're asked to, right? We believe in communication. And I think, to answer your question, there really isn't much that we can do other than really monitor it. And if it gets to a situation where it's affecting the performance of their duties, they get discipline or corrective action is taken, whether they need help or we place them on administrative leave. These are all things that we have. But we, we try not to do that with the understanding that everybody has everybody has problems, right? Well, the big thing is we're talking about mental health, right? Mental health is a, it's, it's a hot topic. It's real. You know, the chief talked earlier about uh, a situation that we engaged someone who had mental health issues. That goes for police officers too. So we need to handle it the same way um, and with care. Um, and I find just through my experience is that we don't have any issues in that in that way because I think you know when you build when when you when you build an organization and everyone in the organization communicates and they trust each other, it, it's it's not a problem for someone to say, hey, you know, I, I'm going through a tough time right now. Um, the chief has an open door policy, right? Every one of our command staff has an open door policy. We have a chain of command that we follow, but that doesn't mean that if someone has a, a good relationship with me or the chief and if they're going through something and they want to talk to somebody, that doesn't mean we shut them out. They go to whoever they're comfortable with and we, we address it the best way we can. Um, 
So I hope that answered your question. Do you have a psychologist or psychiatrist on staff? EAP lieutenant. Yeah. So we have the, what's called the uh, EAP. It's an employee assistance program, which is not really attached to the police department. It's town wide. So if there's an officer or a supervisor, anybody in our organization or anybody throughout the town who's a town employee, if they're having some issues, we have an, EA, an employee assistance program where they would have access to uh, clinicians or psychologists or whatever that they need. Could I expound uh, on that just a little of bit? Of course you can. The so, <laughs> so, so employee assistance, it really is great because we can, we can offer this program to the people that, that need assistance. And all the town knows is that someone from the town is utilizing uh, the assistance. So it could be someone has a gambling problem, or it could be someone's going through a divorce. They get a counseling session with an attorney. It runs the gamut. It's not just about mental health. It could be about a bunch of things. I know as chief, I had an employee uh, I could tell was having a very difficult time, um, and it was over the divorce. And she, the, the person basically said, you know, I'm seeing someone. Counsel says, no, no, they can help you with an attorney. They can help you with different things. You, you want to change your will. Um, so it, it's a great program that the town does offer. And whenever there's an issue, that's the first thing that rolls off my tongue is, hey, there's a program that's here to help you. And I won't know, no one will know. Um, and, and I've actually had an employee, not here in Westboro, somewhere where else that I worked, where we offered the program, uh, and he really did thank me you know, for it. Um, it. It helped him tremendously. So it's, it really is a great program. And just to remind everyone, starting July 1st, we have our own clinician now. We're not sharing her with uh, South Road and North Bird anymore. Uh, because we've been so busy mental health wise. So it's another person in the building that may say, Lieutenant, I've noticed that <laughs> Officer so and so, I think something's going on, you know, type of thing. So in, this is a trained clinician that's in our building every day now. So sorry to take that. No, away. it's okay. <laughs> this happens a lot. Whenever we're in the same space, I'll talk and he takes the mic away. <laughs> Are you waiting for a promotion? I Again, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, maybe speaking more generally, so people won't know someone in the department it may refer to. Within the state, uh, if someone does go for mental health or something like that, does this impact badly on there being a police officer? You hear that in the military, if somebody wants counseling, some people don't go for it because they fear it will affect their clearances or something. But just a very broad answer. So, um, broadly speaking, I would say, you know, obviously, if someone's having, it, it depends on how significant the problem is, right? Um, if the problem's significant that it, it inhibits their ability to become a police officer, yes, obviously, it's going to impact um, to a certain extent. But the thing is, is the key, the key to all of this is just realizing that everyone, everyone has issues and they can be resolved. There is help. Right, and we will give them whatever time is needed to resolve whatever issue um, there is, and and to come back to work. Um, I see the chief walking over here. Well, <laughs> the, the other issue, what we have is if we feel like say someone's a danger to themselves right. or an issue like that, we have the ability to send them for a fitness for duty. So they go to basically professional uh, organization who will just evaluate them. And they'll tell us, no, this person is fit for duty, or no, they're not. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what paid administrative leave is for, um, you know, to get them the help they need so they can return to work. The goal is, no matter what the issue is, discipline-wise, is to correct the behavior and help that officer, that individual, that supervisor, so they can return. Because our, our most precious resource in the police department is our people. You know, so that's why I said to you, those officers, when I, I was actually came back, I was away for a few days, the first thing I did was I called each individual officer to make sure that they were okay here, that they were okay, because I could see this was a stressful call. You could see it on them, you know, they handled it very professionally, but, and that's what it's there for. So we would be able to, hey, you know, we have a system in place if you need it. No, Chief, I'm good, we've talked about it, and it, it worked out really well, you know. So I actually want to share something personal about myself um, with regards to what the Chief's talking about. Um, prior to working in Westboro, I worked a short time uh, for the community of Bolton Police Department. I was hired there. I worked there for about a year and a half before I came back to Westboro. 
um, and two weeks prior to coming back to Westboro, they tell us, the administration says, hey, if you're going to another department, try to be reactive in your policing because we don't want anything, you know, we don't have to send you to court when you're working in Westboro, you gotta come back and do all this stuff. So I was really just in reactive mode. And this just goes, what I'm about to tell you goes to show you how things could change for a split, in a split second for us. Um, so if anyone knows Bolton, uh, obviously 495 runs through it. Uh, Route 62 is one exit before Bolton, one exit south. Um, I had a situation where Bolton's obviously a very small community and um, I was working a midnight to eight shift. I was by myself, right? So that's what you see in a lot of commu smaller communities. You have one officer responding to calls. Um, so because Bolton's so small, um, we had to actually drive to Berlin, which is one exit south of Bolton, to get gas at a, at a gas station. It was on Route 62. Um, I think it was a Sunoco at the time. It's changed since then. But my particular cruiser that day, it was getting a new scanner, and it was department policy for us to keep a scanner on. For those of you that don't know what a scanner is, it monitors police broadcasts all, all around the area. This particular day, I did not have my scanner on, and I didn't realize that there was a high-speed pursuit coming from a neighboring um, jurisdiction. I think it was Marlboro. And um, this guy had rammed several police cars. He was on his way to actually to kill his wife, is what it was. And I was in that path, and I didn't know. So I come off the exit, happy as a clam. It's 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh, my cruiser's you know, almost on empty, I'm gonna go fill it up, fill it up. So I go in, I use the, the, the card, fill the cruiser up, I'm about to go back to 495 North, all of a sudden I come across a vehicle in the middle of Route 62, demolished, demolished. And it was a, um, it was that mail that I was just telling you about, but I didn't know what his intent was. <clears throat> so he proceeds to get out of the vehicle and he start, and he is staring at me. And I could tell you, I remember, a lot of what happened before and what happened after. My mind was blank in the middle. And at the time, we had a, a, a dash cam that would record you know, incidents. Anytime I turned on the lights, it would show a recording and it would show you know, whatever it was that I did. Um, so this person took his own life um, in front of me. However, I remember being confronted with, okay, I have a situation here, I called for help. I, I forgot everything that I did. You know, we talk about training, but my training kicked in and kind of took on autopilot. Um, so this person took his own life, and I remember watching on video, just I was operating on my own. My mind was completely blank, completely blank. Um, the chief at the time, she responded to the scene, and I could see on camera, she's like, I'm looking at the car where everything happened uh, and this, this person on the ground and I'm just staring, right? Because I, my mind was like off. And I could see her saying, hey, you okay, you okay? And I wouldn't respond. So she brought me off to the side and she said, listen, I'm gonna send you home with another officer. I'm gonna give you a day to process this. You need to come back. We need to get you some help. And I kept telling her that I was okay. And uh, I'm getting a little choked up because this is a situation that I had a good boss that helped me out. So um, long story short, I'm so embarrassed, but you know that's, that's how it is. But these are the things that affect our police. So I just wanted to let you know, that's all. But you got through it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I did. And this is why it's important, and I remember for the first few weeks that I came, um, that I came to Westboro, I was on high alert for everything. Um, you know, every car stop that I made, I was thinking, okay, is, what is this person going to do, right? You know, am I going to run into the same situation? And that's not realistic, right? But that's where my mind was. So, you know, so just remember that. You know, when you're dealing with, you know, police and the stuff that we deal with, just think about that. So that's all. I'm good. <laughs> and I can, tell you, I can tell you, every officer that um, 
that I've worked with, to include myself, I could tell you some horror stories. Mm -hmm. And I had a great boss, too, uh, in Auburn for one of mine. And um, he did the same thing that uh, Lieutenant Daniels, uh, the chief did in Bolton, and made sure I got the help that I needed, a couple of incidents. And, and every officer here uh, has those type of, you know, skeletons that we cram in the closet, um, no matter how big a town or how small. I mean, you go to Paxton, you know, Robert Mortel shot and killed in the town of Holden. I mean, I know with me, um, you know, it's there's been a, a whole host of things that uh, have really uh, impacted me as a person, as a dad. Uh, the critical incident in Auburn I talked about was my first Father's Day. So Father's Day is coming. That's always a tough day for me. Um, and and it's, it's what really guides us. And, and long after I'm gone, uh, my hope here is in Westboro that the Ron Miller, that was the chief that I had in Auburn, that style of policing continues because it's his playbook that I use every day uh, for the last nine years um, with my own little spin. And I'm passing it along to my current command staff, uh, because I think several of them will be chiefs someday, may not be in Westboro. I mean, I didn't start my career here. You know, it's been a journey uh, traveling from Shrewsbury to Auburn to Uxbridge to here. And each step, there's been some, there's some things that, that have been very interesting as, as a chief and as a police officer, but at the end of the day, one of the most important roles that we have as managers is to ensure uh, the physical and mental health of our employees, and ABLE has a wellness component to it. And it's why we've embraced it, one of the only agencies that I'm aware of um, in our area that has embraced it. And that's what we're about. We want to be forward thinking, we want to think outside the box, and bring the very best in public safety services to those we serve. And at the end of the day, we need tires that meet the road, and there's just not enough of us. But the reason why we're doing as well as we're doing, we've embraced technology, body cameras, I know chiefs that are having a heck of a time impact bargaining body cameras. Our staff accepted it. And we've already had complaints that have come in that have been mitigated because our officers did nothing wrong. We followed policy and procedure, um, and these individuals were having a bad day. So uh, these, are, these are things that we face as managers, but like I said, the most important role uh, that we have is ensuring that uh, we stay healthy, uh, both physically you know, and mentally. Um, and like I said, we take it very seriously. And, and if there is a complaint, we take that very seriously too. So, <clears throat> Chief, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah, I just got a question. The the uh, the whole George Floyd thing really, really, uh, as you said, it just was it, the whole police departments and the whole world, whole country took a took a hit for that. Um, and and the the I just have a question about procedures that police follow. Um, the the are the let's say let's say here in Westboro are the procedures that you follow are they visible to the public uh, and secondly if there's a procedure there um, it, that uh, you follow that the public wants removed and replaced with a different procedure is there a process in place to do that so I mean my model of policing is I'll always take suggestion not direction uh, I'm the police chief uh, the buck stops with me both good and bad right. Um, our policies are basically vetted through the state. Um, our policies right now are not online. Once we are accredited, and all our, we've rewrote the entire policy procedure manual of this department since I started. Our policies were from the 80s when I took over. Did you, did you get any public input for that? So, no. I mean, pu people will call me and you know, give suggestions for certain things, whether it be body cameras. But these are basically vetted policies in law enforcement that really we are going to find different agencies that have what we believe are the best policies that are best practices for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's like telling a doctor how to do surgery. I'm a police chief. You know, this is from law enforcement angles, from, from people that have been doing this for years, best practices, and that's why we're going through the accreditation process is to make sure that we have best practices. Also post. And, 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 and that's the Peace Officer Standing and Training Commission that's also implementing all these new rules and regulations that we're going to have to follow because now we're going to be certified. And I, I think I've said this, we've embraced post. I've embraced post. There, there are a lot of people out there um, that don't like this. I think certification is a good thing. I think if you lose your certification, you lose it for a reason. And that means you can no longer be a police officer. Where right now, in a lot of cases of discipline, what happens is the person will resign prior to the discipline being, being mitigated and now that person can get a job somewhere else. So um, we take it very seriously, and we would obviously talk 
to the resident who have the concerns and we would explain our, this is why our policies are in place and why and there are several departments that do that that place their, their policies online and that's what we're going to do so just like our, our staffing study you can go right on our web page um, just like if you have a traffic request there's traffic enforcement you go right on our web page you're gonna be able to go right on our web page and you can go through the policies that you want to look at they'll all be there hundreds of them, hundreds of them but none of them can be changed so they're always going to be changed by, so, by, by us. So basically what's going to happen is the accreditation commission or the post commission is going to say, this is what we want you to do. This is the practice that we want you to have. This is the best practice. <clears throat> and then we will change that. And that commission's not just made up of police officers. It's made up of different people. Um, there's a judge, yeah. clinician. Um, clinician. So there's a wide gamut of people that have say, and I'll, I'll give you, if you would, I'll, um, I'll give you a quick example. So I told you I was responsible for body worn cameras, right? Um, we created a policy that we thought fit Westboro and that was best for what we do. However, there's a <clears throat> subcommittee that has formed specifically for this that is going to tell us, give us not guidance, but also a standard for how the policy should be created. So that's essentially what Post <coughs> does. That's the um, I guess uh, when you look at a credit and don't get me wrong these are two separate things that we're talking about post is for an individual officer and certification with some guidelines of how we should proceed with certain policies that affect and body cameras uh, actually one and of there those are public too. hearings so the public does have access and input you know at these hearings and then the policy is then uh, created and then as the chief I implement it but things change and the accreditation commission will say hey there's a better way of doing things and then we update the policy so the policies and procedures it's an ebb and flow it's it's not just okay we're done now it's gonna it's it's a huge undertaking administratively and and that's why that that position was so important um, and, and like I said, in, in this day and age with liability and the different issues that we're facing, best practices is what we're embracing here in Westboro. Yes? I don't have a question. I'd just like to say that we are very, very proud of our police department. Oh, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. I really do. And yesterday was Share the Love. Yeah, it was great. We had a, uh, a Touch a Truck event. Um, and it was, it, I know for me, you know, I leave there, drive home, I'm 10 feet off the ground. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it really is something. So if you ever get a chance to attend that, it's, it's, it's Methodist Church? Methodist Church. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Methodist Church. Oh, they, do, they do a great job. Love working with those folks. And uh, the whole town, to be honest with you. I mean, we have a lot of diversity, you know, in town. And, and we really appreciate that. We just had some, some uh, active... Uh, shooter training at uh, Benai Shalom at one of our uh, Sikh temples in town. You know, we really uh, appreciate, you know, the love and the support that, that we feel. And we realize we can't make everyone happy, um, but, you know, we're going to do the best we can. I, I say all the time, perfection is an unattainable goal, uh, but we're going to try. And I can tell you today is not my best day. Um, I'm hoping tomorrow is. But it's just constantly. The day I say everything's perfect and everything's great, I need to go. <laughs> and you're stuck with me for two more years anyway. So, uh, but if there's anything you folks want to hear, please reach out to me and the lieutenant. We'd be happy. Yes. Would you consider offering us at some point a program? Citizens Police Academy. Citizens Police Academy. We were going to have one, and then COVID happened. Well, wow. My other concern is I feel perfectly safe here in Westboro. You should. And, and I do, truly. But with all these shootings in schools and churches and synagogues, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe, but what can we do? Sitting here right now, we have members of the police department, we're safe in my brain, but there's something else going on outside. Yeah, we, what? so as a police department, we prepare <coughs> to the best of our ability, and that's from training, and that's when I talk about, you know, Asher and different things, um, you know, uh, 
we are trying to roll things out. I know through the town, I had a, I had a senior leadership team meeting yesterday with the town manager talking about some of the safety concerns I had for the fire department. You know, that, you know, there's no ballistic glass for the dispatchers there. You know, they, how they got into that glass door is there something we can do to better secure. Even my own station uh, made me look at the own, my own police, not that I want to share what my concerns are on camera, uh, <laughs> but we, we talked about that and we're going to take corrective action uh, on these things. And, that, and that's how we learn. These incidents that you talk about, the, there's a learning to them. And, and I know Texas, um, you know, it's a very, it's a small town, smaller than Westboro. It can happen everywhere. but. The way the media is nowadays, when something does happen, it's like, it's, it's like it happened in, in North Brown. You know, it's just it's like it happened right next door. And I, I will never say it can't happen there, but we're training extremely hard, uh, your police department. I went to executive session to the school committee um, to talk about safety because they had concerns, you know, and, and about what Westboro is doing. The last thing I wanted to do at the very first town meeting, that I, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. I don't want to ramble on too long, but we, um, so I'm getting ready it was actually my birthday. I was at a select meeting. I'm getting ready to sign my contract to start. I, I hadn't started yet. I was going to start in two weeks, right? Two weeks. And I'm sitting there at the select meeting waiting. And this really nice gentleman is asking the board to consider a warrant article to stock fish in a pond, right? And I'm going, okay. So he asked for a certain amount of money and he gets a little more. And I turned to my wife and I said, honey, we're going fishing. <laughs> and I talked to the town manager at the time and I said this to him, I said, listen, there is a really big concern that I have, uh, equipment concern that I have, to your, to your direct question, um, our firearms are way beyond their lifetime, you know, and we don't have state-of-the-art patrol rifles, right, Texas, AR-15s, right, I mean, we, we didn't have state-of-the-art. We didn't have Kevlar helmets. We didn't have level four body armor that will stop that rifle round. So what I did was I called up Lieutenant Minardi at the time. I had already written um, a warrant article in Uxbridge previously for this, for this equipment, for the Kevlar helmets and for the body armor, and we were going through um, uh, buying new firearms. So we worked together. He put together uh, this warrant article, and it was basically, it was supposed to be submitted earlier than this, but we got it in. I started, uh, my first town meeting was, I don't even think I was here a month, um, and it was passed. And that, is, I don't want patrol rifles in the cars. I don't want Kevlar helmets in the cars. I don't want level four body armor in the cars. I have to have them in the cars, because if something happens at the high school, mm -hmm. and I roll up in my little electric car, and I throw on my body on my helmet, I'm going in. I'm not waiting outside like they did in Texas. I'm going in, and I'm going to take care of the threat based on the training uh, and the commitment I have to making sure our kids are safe. And then what's going to happen is we're going to deem an area warm, safe, when everything's neutralized, and we're going to bring in the fire department, and if it's not neutralized, we're still going, to help these kids. They have level four body armor and Kevlar helmets. And whoever would have thought, right? 34 years ago, you know, uh, this September I'll be on the job, 34 years that we needed these tools. And when I hear people talk about the demilitarization of the police, I love that, right? It's just not possible. We, we are here. When something happens right now at Hastings, him and I are jumping in his cruiser and we're going in just like this if we don't have emergency equipment and we're going to take care of that, that threat and make sure people are safe. And then again, turn off. You know, that warrior mentality and start becoming a guardian and helping these, these staff and these kids that are, that, you know, face the unimaginable. And we're, we're doing active shooter now. I, I sit on Homeland Security for Central Massachusetts. I'm a voting member. Um, I think I'm going to be chair on the law enforcement side soon. Uh, the Brookfield Chief's retiring at the end of the month. Um, and one of the reasons why I do that is to make sure when this funding and this training and their issues that we bring them back here. One of the first things we did when I came here is we had active shooter training at the middle school on a $40,000 grant through Homeland Security. We're constantly looking for money outside of our budget to get these things done. We, we've trained several of our officers, at least two, that go to the schools, that go to B'nai Shalom, that go to different you know, organizations that we've given it to, to in the private sector. 
You know, anyone who wants it, we're here to, to help. That's why we have a canine. You know, that vehicle was out of Homeland Security. That, that wasn't purchased, you know, through Westboro tax dollars. Now, your tax dollars purchased that, make no mistake about it, on the federal level, we want to make sure we bring those federal tax dollars back to Westboro. We want to make sure that we're looking at every possible avenue because we I understand, you know, your taxes went up. So, yes. I was just wondering, the, speaking for all police officers all over the country, do you, are police officers in favor of more gun control or not? So, all I can say is this. What I don't agree with is that some 18-year-old mm -hmm. kid, your brain's still developing, so you're in your mid-20s, can walk in somewhere and walk out with a patrol rifle. I can tell you, if you qualify for a firearm, I will grant it. I am the licensing authority, right? But if you don't, there's criteria we look at. Could be mental health, could be criminal background, it could be whatever. I think what Massachusetts is doing is what should be done. So, um, you know, as far as, as gun control, I think people have the right to, to bear arms. Um, I will tell you, you know, you can't have a high capacity magazine here in Massachusetts, when you're seeing a lot of these shootings at high capacity magazines, you know, lots and lots of bullets uh, in these magazines. So there are some things that I, I definitely agree with, but I also, there are a lot of good people out there that they have a certain right to it. But I think there should be standards, and I think the Massachusetts standard, and maybe that's a good topic I'll bring in uh, my lieutenant who oversees licensing, and he can explain all the, the complete process that it goes through, yes. What's your opinion on arming staff in the schools? I'm totally against it, 100% against it. The training that we go through is crazy. How are we gonna train all these teachers and God forbid something else happens or someone gets a hold of that <coughs> firearm out of the classroom? No, I, I don't, I do not agree with, uh, with that at all. I and mean, there are some chiefs that do, but I don't, you know. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't like walking into school with a firearm. You know what I mean? I, I don't think a, any, a gun needs to be, you know, unless you're highly, highly, highly trained. That's my personal opinion as your chief. Uh, other chiefs may have a different uh, feeling on it. Uh, I, listen, I was on a SWAT team. I was a team leader, I was a team commander. I was the unit control chief over it. It's 85 cities and towns. I, I oversee some like Central Massachusetts Florida Post Council. It took a lot of work for me to be proficient. I'm not a gun guy. I don't like them. The first time I fired a, 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 a gun was right before I went to the police academy in Shrewsbury. You know? So uh, I can tell you Ron Miller, same thing. He was not a gun guy, my chief in Auburn. We had an armored car robbery. The bad guys were shooting at the good guys with high-powered rifles. At the time, we had shotguns. Two weeks later, every shotgun's out of the car, and we had patrol rifles. And he was not a gun guy at all. And I, I t trust me, he's my mentor. Um, yes. Uh, Judge, you know, uh, I, 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 I was telling him, Alan, Alan Gordon, when he was lead chief here, he said, you know, he go, Congress won't do anything about, about gun control because they're afraid of the NRA. Well, I mean, politics is everywhere, whether you're a small town or the federal government. And, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, at the end of the day, I think safety needs to be looked at and things need to change. Uh, too many. As you stated, there are just too many. It, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in a school, whether it be in a religious institution, something's got to change. And, you know, like I said, bigger brains than me, hopefully we'll figure it out uh, and we need to work together. And I think that's what you have here in Westboro. I walk into department head meetings and egos are at the door. How can we help each other, right? That's, that's the mindset that our, that the town of Westboro has, that's the mindset the Commonwealth should have, that's the mindset our country should have. Um, but that's just, like I said, sometimes I give you my personal opinions. Um, this isn't Westboro talking, this is Jeff Laurie talking, who happens to be a police chief. So, without, with that being said, I think we're done. I'm gonna get back to the office, more work to do. And thank you again for having us. Thank you.